certain things that just are not worth your time. And it's maybe not about the money, maybe, you know, one of those things, but there's things you shouldn't do. That clip from New York City jazz bassist Sean Connolly kicks off today's episode about life in the trenches, what it's like working as a jazz bassist, the highs, the lows, and everything in between. I know a lot of you will relate to this. We're continuing our series, uh, rounding out this series of highlights from the past 13 years on the podcast, and we have a great set of characters here today. Characters. (laughs) Well, some of our characters. Um, Here today on the podcast talking about their work life and what they do, and I really hope you enjoy what we've got in store today. A quick shout out to our sponsors, Steve Swan String Bass, D'Addario Strings, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Modacity, Colstein Music, and A440 Violin shop more on them later in this episode but let's continue that clip that we just started sean Connolly, and we were hanging out at one of his local places right on the edge of harlem and uh, talking about life in the trenches as a jazz musician it's a hard lesson to learn it's a lesson yeah. i'm continuing to learn well i think all of us because you yeah. know we the landlord never stops you right. know uh, we're all on the edge of you know scared about money i think all the time in the freelance world you know I, it's tough too because i think i think sometimes well you've been doing this so long maybe you maybe you have the experience to spot the obvious great opportunity but sometimes i'm not sure what the great opportunity yeah. is yeah that's right and and it's it's hard to it's hard to know uh, i've been trying to get better at listening within yeah, and seeing like right. is this uh absolutely like i'm all in or yeah, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, also, you know, if you do things for the wrong reason, it's going to come out in yeah. your personality and maybe even in the music. Yeah. You know, you just can't fake what we do on that level or, you know, it has mm-hmm. to be real. Yeah. Know? So, yeah, you know, if a guy's a jerk and he doesn't pay good, I mean, you know, I have to fight for money or, you know, chase people around. I'm just not going to do it at this age. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to be angry for a month while I can't get my money from you. Right, I'm right. not going to be screamed at for weird you know what i mean yeah the possible negative sides of a gig speaking of challenges but also opportunities ben allison talks about striking out on your own as an independent artist and some of the advantages and disadvantages so this record is is going to be the second that i've produced myself so i i can kind of set the release date whenever i want yeah my plan is to do it in early april okay that seems about right timing wise i mean uh you know we're, we're going to be Recording in early January, and then I'm going to be kind of out on the road for, yeah, on and off for about six weeks. And during that time, I'm going to be doing my best to, to kind of get the mixes together and everything like that um, and get it into production. The vinyl will take a little bit longer, but I think somewhere around the April time frame is when I'm thinking of uh, releasing the bulk of it. And then the, then the vinyl version will come a little bit later. Okay. Okay, cool. That's got to be one of the advantages of doing your own thing is not being beholden to like, here, it has to come out, bang, March 15th or anything like that. That's right. I mean, although I, I do like deadlines, so, but all the deadlines are self-imposed <laughs> these days, which is nice. So I have freedom and I can kind of coordinate things the way I want rather than the way uh, someone else wants. But still, it's important to have deadlines. I, I basically, at this point, work, you know, put a schedule together really on paper about how things are going to roll out and there are a lot of moving pieces. Yeah. One of the things about being an independent artist now is that you actually have to coordinate all of those moving pieces from the tours to the musicians, to the production, to the promotion and all that sort of thing, which is fun and challenging freedom, but more work. You've heard from two New York city area jazz bassists and that's uh not surprising since there are so many jazz bassists there and it's such a hub for jazz let's hear from one more and this is one of my former students dan shimolinsky about what it's like starting out as a jazz bassist in new york well still building um yeah, that's the sure. short answer you know this is new york city and it is one of the most competitive places uh on the planet especially if you want to do jazz and um there are just so many good musicians here that really when you first arrive it can be very overwhelming and it was for me for sure i had classmates uh other bassists that were working a lot more than me and had kind of already laid the groundwork uh for coming to new york city and had visited here before and knew people here before and so it's really easy to get discouraged uh at first because you look around and you just go man everybody has work except me you know and and i just felt like this homebody that was kind of like at Juilliard all the time, working on my studies, just trying to get good grades. Meanwhile, there's this whole other world that's happening 
outside of the Juilliard bubble, as we say. Um, you know, because Juilliard is a lot of work. It takes a lot of work and it, it takes a lot of dedication. Um, and so you can spend all of your time working on Juilliard coursework and you can spend all of your time practicing and you can spend all of your time writing. But there is this tremendous feeling that like, oh, there's, it's, you know, almost like a fear of missing out thing, which is like, you know, there's this whole rich tradition of New York jazz. And so it's like, well, maybe, maybe I should be doing that. And there is truth to uh, and value to both mentalities. I'm glad that I really spent the majority of my first couple of years focusing on my studies because I learned a tremendous amount about the instrument, um, gained the respect of my teachers, and, and really um, felt like I made so much substantial progress on my playing, um, my improvising, uh, just my, my feeling for the music uh, in those years. But there is nothing that really beats real world experience. And so in New York, there's kind of a, a mentality that if you go to jam sessions and you stay out till two, three in the morning and you, and you meet and you network, um, that that can lead to gigs. And so I kind of subscribed to that theory as I got into my sophomore year, junior year, um, I was hanging out and trying to meet as many people as I could. And basically my theory was, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm living in the dorms at this point. You know, I'm, I'm a student. I'm just trying to work wherever I can. You know, I really didn't care how much gigs paid. I didn't care um, what the gigs were. I didn't care what the repertoire was. It's just like, I'm Dan. I have a bass. I want to bring my voice to whatever you're doing. I've said it a million times. You're making something by hand out of wood. You can do everything right and it can still go sideways. That's Eric Roy of Upton Bass talking about their concept of no B stock. And though it's painful to work a piece of wood for days and discover some flaw, the right call, and this is what Upton does every time, is to just get rid of that wood and start new. You never know what's going on under the surface. Despite your best efforts, wood is an organic thing, and Upton takes its commitment to quality seriously. Learn more at UptonBase.com, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. Steve has been active in the bass world and also the guitar world for years. Here's a bit from our live podcast taping with Steve on how he got into that business. Guitars and basses. Guitars and basses. Okay, how did that happen? They're both helper instruments. I've always... Oh played the rhythm guitar quite often with bass lines moving, either in swing style, jazz style, or country style. Bass is the same thing, supporting the band, the group of people you're playing with. So I've always felt like I was a support person. I love how Steve describes being a support person, and he is certainly that for the bass community here on the West Coast, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. His shop is located just south of San Francisco, and he has a large retail showroom with about 70 basses on display. And these basses are professional top-of-the-line basses. These basses are student-level basses and everything in between. They're beautifully set up. So if you're looking for a bass or you know someone who is, be sure to check out Steve at steveswanstringbass.com. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast, Steve. Now let's leave the city of New York, which I love, and take a look at people that are either living or working overseas, what that experience is like. And I want to start out with Herbert Smith, who is a longtime Los Angeles resident and has been living for the last several years in Brazil. So then I contacted the guy, and within a month, I had almost 30 students. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So and nobody speaks English here. <laughs> nobody. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And so for me, it's great because in the eight years I've been here, I've been able to synthesize everything yeah. and so now so now people look for me i teach in the i teach in the stock exchange i teach in the bank of brazil i teach in the uh irs these are the places i teach wow so my, i have a i have a strong infrastructure for my music here which is my school i made an art out of it i Boy. made art out out of out of teaching English. Well, did you ever did you ever imagine you'd be doing this like like nine ten years ago back in Southern California? No, it must no. Be, yeah, <laughs> no, no. Um, 
it was um it was amazing you know the when i think back um why i'm here and what my life has evolved to and uh the music especially because when i when i got here um i joined uh i joined the studio band first just to cuz i didn't know the language and a, a, a lot of the musicians speak english mm -hmm. so i joined i joined the studio band and so uh, we played wave and so um they said one <laughs> Two, one, two, and, and the da di da da. They said stop. So they said, <laughs> let's try again. One, two, da di da, stop. And so they said, let me see your music. So they had they. they I showed them my music, and they they just took my music and they did it like this. <laughs> they crumpled it up. <laughs> and they said they said give him the music, and so they gave me the music. And they said, "What is different in our music?" Well, I said, "Well, let me see. You tore you tore mine up. So I opened it back up, and it was in two four. Oh, and so and so they said they said they said we'll tell you one time. <laughs> Nobody's ever told you this, but Bossa is in two. Next up, we have John Goldsby talking about what it's like working in the WDR big band in Cologne. People ask, you know, what's our daily schedule like in the WDR Big Band? And it's basically like an orchestra gig where we rehearse Monday through Friday and we do projects. So every project lasts maybe a week or even two weeks and we'll do one, two or three concerts, maybe more at the end of the rehearsal period. So the rehearsals get recorded in the recording studio for radio play, but then we also do live concerts that might be uh, internet live stream or a TV show or whatever. And uh, every project is unique. Uh, so we don't really have a band book, you know, like the, we don't have the red book and the blue book right. that we pick charts out of. We just, every project is uh, fresh. And usually we have a guest soloist or a lot of times we have a guest soloist and the, the music is arranged uh, new every time for the, the band. So it's constantly playing new music written for the big band. And it's like an orchestra season. You, we start usually in September and go through June or July and uh, probably do 25 different projects in the course of the year. Wow, it's, in, the, um, yeah, it's incredibly similar to an orchestra. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the, we recently got two new additions to the band. The chief conductor or the principal conductor is Bob Mincer. So Bob, the great saxophone player and also great arranger, he does about five projects a year with us. And then Vince Mendoza is the composer in residence, which is kind of a misnomer because he doesn't actually reside in Cologne. <laughs> but uh, he is the composer in residence and he does, yeah, five or six projects with us per year. Jazz bassist Katie Thoreau, who I actually got to see live uh, recently, which is very cool. She talks about all the cool venues she's worked across the globe. A lot of fun recently going to Denmark. And the oh. audiences are incredible because they're like, they know so much about the music. And when they love something, they'll all clap in unison. <laughs> so you'll get, and it was funny because then it, it reminded me of, um, I had, there's, you know, these Oscar, Oscar Peterson records in Denmark or in Finland, and there's all this unison clapping. And I'm like, oh, it's the unison clapping. This is great. They love it. <laughs> uh, so I always felt really welcome there. And then there's just some rooms um, in the country that, in here, that are just old jazz rooms. There's a place uh, a little bit south of San Francisco called the Bach Dynamite and Dancing Club. And they've had everyone from Cedar Walton, Ray Brown, just everyone had been there and it's just these old heavy steeped jazz rooms uh also in chicago the green mill was oh, yeah it did did two two great nights there and it was unbelievable it was like packed with people and they were totally attentive when they needed it to be and then on the breaks we're having a good time but it was you just felt so welcome there. speaking of chicago venues here is larry gray talking about the history of the venerable jazz showcase well, it's an amazing place, and it's kind of like when somebody, when a guy says, I have a great axe, 
this is a fantastic axe. I've, I've had four heads and 13 handles, you know, on it or something, <laughs> something, something along those lines. It's kind of like, I mean, the, the, the jazz showcase is Joe Siegel. Mm -hmm. It's just Joe Siegel. And oftentimes in history, there's one person that, that makes all the difference. Yeah. And, and if this person had decided to do something else, there wouldn't have been like a second person who would have just stepped up and done it. Or, well, we don't know, but we'll never know. But right. maybe, maybe there would, and very likely maybe there wouldn't be. Like, like the Village Vanguard in New York is like that, Max Weinberg. Sure. This, this, is, what, this is what Joe Siegel is. Joe Siegel had a concept. He has, a, he has an idea. And it started out, I mean, I mean, it started out in 1947. I'm born in 54, gang. So, so that's, that's a long time ago, you know, that he was doing this. He started out as a student at Roosevelt, ironically, oh, wow. um, coincidentally. He had booked, he booked Charlie Parker at Roosevelt. You know, now, huh. Charlie Parker wasn't on the radar of the conservatory, you know, you know people. But, but, I mean, that's, that was Joe's, uh, that's what Joe did. Uh, you know, he came to Chicago, I guess, as a student. He's from Philadelphia. So this jazz showcase thing, um, you, you know, became a concept. And at first, like, like when we first went, and Jason, that was a huge influence on my life because coming from the suburbs, the southwest suburbs, driving in at the age of 16 to hear Elvin Jones, I mean, this was unbelievable. Oh, and man. Joe Siegel would put that in the North Park Hotel, the North Park Hotel, 1936 North Clark. It's just like apartment buildings now. It's right near Armitage and Clark. We would drive up there as kids. And he only, it was only one day a week. He had it on Sunday. Um, on Friday and Saturday, I think he had certain artists at a, at a place called the Pumpkin Room on the South Side. So the most he would ever do was three nights. Um, the dates, uh, the years on this would be the early '70s. Like, um, well, wait a minute here. Yeah, 1970 actually. Mm, okay. So um, uh, yeah, so we drive up to North Park. Elvin Jones would play a two-hour set. Then we'd go get a couple of hot dogs on North Avenue. We'd come back, and Elvin Jones would play another two-hour set. You'd be sitting on a chair in front of him. Well, boy, I found out, you know, 20 years later, that all the people that I met, you know, in, in playing jazz, you know, you know, the so-called best players or whatever, the players who were getting all the gigs, the young, the young players who were coming on the scene, you know, Paul Wertico, Joel Spencer, Kelly Sill, mm -hmm. you know, you name it, all these people, Ed Peterson, they were all there. <laughs> We were all, oh, were you there? Oh, yeah, man, I was there. And we remembered all those sets. So the, so the influence of Joe Siegel is like immeasurable on presenting this music over 60, almost 70 years now of presenting this music. If he makes it to 2017, you know, and he will, yeah. it's going to be, that's going to be, that's going to be that long. It's just, it's just mind boggling. So, so. There are a lot of career options out there for musicians, and Barry Colstein of Colstein Music has some great advice about keeping your options open. I, I generally will tell anybody that goes off to, you know, go as performance, go after your dreams, but also prepare yourself, you know, because it's not always the easiest profession to, to pursue. And I'm a firm believer that in life you... you, you pick up as much knowledge as you can. Those are your armament in life, and you put them in your back pocket. You may never have to draw upon it, but it's a nice thing to have. Colson & Sons, for 70 years now, has been working to connect bass players with the finest instruments and help them achieve their goals and find those opportunities in their lives. Thank you so much to Barry and everybody at Colstein Music for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Diderio Strings. Our friends at Diderio want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Make sure you have the right size string for your bass. String sizes are determined by playing length, the distance from nut to bridge. If your bass has non-standard after lengths before the nut or after the bridge, you may need a different size than you think. Learn more at orchestral.diderio.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Buying an instrument or bow is a major decision, especially the first time a student's looking for an instrument. Here's A440 Violin Shop's Michael Spadaro on what he advises. We usually start with a, an approximate price range, and we'll show them anything within that price range. And then to give them a little bit of context, I'll often show them instruments that are more or less expensive than that. But I, I say to play as many instruments or bows as possible before you buy. Whether you're looking for a new instrument or a new bow or that next step in your journey, A440 Violin Shop has got you covered. 
Look for them online at a440violenceshop.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. We'll wrap up today with two clips that I'll play back to back. The first is Rufus Reed chatting with Wynn Hinkle about J.J. Johnson and starting to work with him. Uh, this comes from back in the day, Contraface Conversations 1.0, whatever, the first few years I did it. And I had a lot of people, sub- well, not a lot, but some people submit guest interviews. And thank you, folks, who did that. That's awesome. And Wynn submitted a couple. This is with Rufus Reed and how cool is that? And then we're going to wrap up with Kenneth Knudsen talking about daily routines and working away from the instrument, which is something that's on my mind more and more as my travel schedule continues to uh, be uh, <laughs> busy. Really good sound. I mean, you'd, and then Dexter had another sound, but it was a big, fat, round, robust sound. So that's what I wanted to have and powerful. J.J. Mm-hmm. Um, Johnson had this pristine, fascinating sound. Mm-hmm. So you can't play poorly with these people mm-hmm. if you want to stay with them, mm-hmm. you know. How did it come about the the uh, gig with J.J. Johnson? <laughs> well, that was a real curious one. I mean, uh, my f- brother gave me my first record was that Walking, you know, with the f- stoplight on the cover of Miles Davis, mm-hmm. and that J.J. and uh, uh, Percy Heath, and, uh, Kenny Clark, and mm-hmm. uh, and I loved that record. Never did I know, think, or even dream that I would get a chance to play with J.J. I was 15 mm-hmm. when I got that record. Mm-hmm. So, I'm in New York, and J.J. is uh, having a resurgence of his career because he had mm-hmm. spent so much time in California right. writing for films and television. And uh, so his manager who coincidentally I, I knew, um, her name was Mary Ann Topper, uh, who, who I actually introduced her to Ray Brown, and of course Ray introduced her to a whole lot of people. And in fact, one of, um, Diana Krall was one of her mm-hmm. clients, and Christian McBride was one of her clients, and Joshua Redmond. So she began to really grow. And then when J.J. decided to come back on the scene, so to speak, he needed someone to kind of handle him, you know, because um, uh, he just did. And so she took him on, and she, she said, well, we, we got to get you a band. So he says, well, uh, he, he knew Cedar Walton, and of course, and uh, I think uh, Louis Nash had done some stuff with us, um, and and uh, there was a young tenor player, I forget his name, but he he played a couple gigs with us, but he really wasn't strong enough, and then Ralph Moore mm-hmm. came in. and But he wanted, he says, I want this bass player that I practice with. And she said, well, what do you mean? She says, well, I have this play-along record, these uh, Jamie Ebersol play-along <laughs> records, and I practice with them every day. J.J. Johnson was a very... Uh, uh, he had a lot of regimen. I mean, he, mm-hmm. he really was... A, he worked hard on things, you know. And so he practiced, and he felt coming back on the scene from playing, he really needed to build his chops up. So he, he loved those those play-alongs mm-hmm. and they're they're actually good uh, uh, devices to, to learn how to play especially if you don't have anybody to play with they're really good so anyway he says I want there's a bass player and he didn't even know my name at the time and he didn't even know I was playing with Dexter Gordon he hadn't, hadn't you know because JJ was kind of a guy when he was out in California he was a composer he didn't listen to jazz anymore so he didn't really he was deep into his thing. So he hadn't really heard my name. If he had, it didn't really mean anything to him. He says, but I want this bass player that I practice with every day because he's playing good. He's got good time. I like his tone and everything. And she said, well, who's his name? And he says, uh, uh, he looks on the disc. He says, oh, this is Rufus Reed. She says, oh, I know him. I can get him. He says, you can get him? And so <laughs> she called me, and I said, "Are you give, is this a trick question? <laughs> you want me to play with J.J. Johnson? And that's how it began. Yeah.
Uh, so I have a, <laughs> it's very sparse. I have a one hour practice, uh, uh, what do you call a schedule, mm -hmm. practice routine I do every day. Um, and then besides that, I, I, I found ways to practice without my instrument mm. because I had, um, I had a few years where I was on the road constantly and I had to find way to practice. I have to find way to improve my musicality, even though I was sitting in an airplane or in a train, stuff like that. So I, I worked out some techniques how, or what to work on when I couldn't touch my instrument. Mm -hmm. So the one hour I spent with my instrument, like that's the minimum, but, and I have to do it. That, that's, that's technique. And then musical thoughts could be like practicing. I have lots of ways of practicing rhythm. For example, I can do that without my instrument. And how many, like to figure out harmonic progressions and stuff like that. I do that without my instrument. Okay. Okay. I would love to break, like what did I, because I too have an hour routine that I do, but I, I, I know everybody's is different. Can, what, what is in that hour routine? What do you do in terms of technical exercises or uh, I, I'd love to know. Okay. So for example, today, just to take an example, I did uh, 20 minutes of, I'm, I'm studying books. I, I, I try to make it through a book in like a month, for example, as like a study book. Right now I'm working on the second book of Jerry Bergonzi. He's a tenor player mm -hmm. and he has this approach with the, uh, with scales, uh, different scales on courts where they don't belong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like how to play outside, for example. Sure. Outside harmony. So right now I'm working on that. Then I do that for 20 minutes. And then I do the same thing on the electric bass for 10 minutes. Uh, do you play a lot of electric bass these days? Man, nothing. If I want an electric bass gig, I have to set it up myself. <laughs> okay. Because I really like playing, but uh, during my years in Berlin, where I played a lot of gigs and, and tours, I only played double bass because I was into this jazz scene. So I think now people see me as a double bass player. Yeah. And then I never get called for electric gigs. <laughs> But I love it. <laughs> so uh, I can I have to take care of that one myself. But I do practice it. I want to keep in shape. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, so uh, at this time away from the base, and I think about this all the time, because like you, I travel a lot. And tomorrow I'm going to be in an airport for probably three hours. And, you know, and so I'm trying to find ways to improve. And again, yeah, I'll, I need to connect you with Danny Zeman. I'll bet you two would have a great conversation because we were talking about thinking about improving. This is kind of like improving your musicianship in general. And that could be with the bass in hand. That could be on a plane thinking through a rhythm or harmony or what have you or some other aspect of your musicianship but we can constantly be improving and some of the time it's with our bass in hand you know what 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 does that so that time without the bass like you were mentioning going through rhythm what are some of those regular things that you do to keep getting better away from the bass yes uh well last year i published an ebook called the rhythm matrix mm -hmm. um and that's something i've been working on a lot trying to figure out how the polypulses sound mm -hmm. And, and what's the, the, the mathematics behind polypulses, which, and that's something I practice daily, mm -hmm. um, all the time. Whenever I'm in some kind of transport, I practice poly, polypulses, um, cause that really sharpens my subdivisions a lot, like being able to hear three and five at the same time and, or even four, five and six at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that's, that's actually my main focus. Uh, and it's been for years because. I like the notes of the bass, but if in, in, in my kind of music in, in the jazz world, if, if the rhythm isn't swinging or tight, the notes doesn't really matter. That's a look at working as a jazz bassist from different perspectives. And we have many more that we could have drawn on, could draw on, can draw on. Uh, but I think it's great to take a look back like this. I hope you're enjoying this series. One more to go, and then we'll be back to our more standard interview format, though we've actually done many of these over the years as I look back. If you want to check out all of them, ContraBaseConversations.com slash highlights. Everything from winning the audition to the business of jazz. I remember that uh, being a really valuable and popular one and many, many others 
in our archives. Thank you to Krista Copper for making this possible and cataloging and time stamping everything here and organizing things into categories so that I can go in like I've done this month and find topics and find things that sound interesting. And I hope that you found this interesting. You can reach out to me at feedback at contrabaseconversations.com. And I want to give a shout out to the rest of the crew on the podcast, Steve Hinchy, Michael Cooper, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Check out Mitch's award-winning bases at mitchmooring.com. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>